Hello and welcome to Glamour Photography Masterclass. I'm Mike Fieldhouse and over the next hour or so I'm going to show you how you can achieve some great studio glamour shots, just like the professionals. What I'm going to do is take you step by step through a typical day's glamour shoot so you can see exactly what goes on in a real studio environment. I'll also be talking about models, the studio, lights, background, reflectors and various other types of photographic equipment. And then I'll be demonstrating some basic yet highly effective lighting setups in the studio. Before any shoot, it's important that you have a strong idea of what you want to achieve. Simply turning up at the studio on the day and hoping everything will fall into place isn't good enough. If you do this, you won't get any good shots and the chances are the day will be wasted. I can't emphasise the words planning enough. You should know exactly what sort of shots you want to achieve, what poses, sets, lights, props. Plan it all out beforehand. Prepare a pose list with sketches and take them to the studio with you to show the model. That way she'll have a better idea of what you want to achieve. If you're short of ideas for poses, look at other photographers' work in books or fashion magazines from the news agents to help trigger your creativity. When you decide on a studio, don't just turn up there on the day. Make sure you know something about the place first so you have an idea of what the setup is like. You'll be able to get an idea of what you can and can't do and what facilities are available. If possible, visit the studio beforehand and discuss your requirements with the studio staff. They can often help with ideas and may even set up props before your arrival. You should spend several days planning and going over how you're going to photograph your model and never wait until the last minute to get the studio ready. Make sure you've got everything set up beforehand. Remember, if you're shooting non-professional models, they'll probably get quite anxious if they have to wait around while you prepare the studio for the shoot. So plan to arrive at the studio at least half an hour before your model to set things up. Though you will have some extra time while your model prepares for the shoot. Finally, just as your location and setting should be prepared before a shoot, so should your equipment. You should know exactly which cameras, lights, lenses and other pieces of equipment you're going to be using. Remember, good photography is planned for. Finding models to pose for you isn't actually that difficult. There are many sources available. You could start by contacting your local photographic studio, who will almost certainly have a register of models that you can hire at a reasonable cost. If you don't know of a local studio, try looking at the ads in the back of photographic magazines. There's usually a geographical listing of photo studios available. If you want the absolute best and are looking for high calibre professional models, then reputable model agencies will be your best bet, but be warned. If you want top models, you have to pay top prices. What you're paying for is sheer professionalism and perfect body statistics. Being a glamour photographer requires a very professional attitude and you can't afford to be cavalier about it. Your approach to a model needs to be pleasing, sensitive, non-threatening and businesslike. With this respectful attitude, your model will react in a more favourable and positive manner, and this will almost certainly reflect in the final pictures. It would also help enormously if you have an assistant, preferably of the same sex as the model, as this will help make the model feel more at ease, less guarded and less intimidated. Let's start by quickly running through the equipment that I'm going to be using, starting with the camera and lenses. The camera is an RZ67 medium format model made by Mamiya. The lenses are a standard 90mm, a 110mm and a 180mm portrait lens. Also for the shoot, I've hired a 250mm lens, which I'll be using for two of the shots. I mostly use the longer lens for my studio glamour work as it gives a more flattering perspective compared to the results from normal or wide angle lenses. And secondly, by using a longer lens, your model will feel a degree of privacy and security. The flash equipment I'm going to be using today is made by Bowens. They're incredibly durable and most importantly, they're extremely reliable. Remember, the last thing you want is for your flash heads to fail in the middle of an important photo shoot. These particular flash heads are called monoblocks, which means you don't need separate power packs to power them. All the controls are contained within the actual head. The units I'm going to be using today are a 1500 joule head, which we'll use for the main light, and two 500 joule heads that will use for fill and backlights. I've also got a couple of 250 joule heads for highlighting parts of the set. Moving on to the light meter, remember accurate and consistent exposures are essential for top quality photography. That's why you'll need to buy a good quality light meter. The one I'm going to use for this shoot is a Minolta Flash Meter 5, although other companies make excellent light meters. 
For most of my studio glamour work, I normally use the meter in its instant light mode. This means you can take the reading from the model, pointing the meter towards the flash head or camera, depending on your method of metering. Next, we come to the all-important tripod. When it comes to studio glamour work, it's vital to have a good sturdy tripod to hand. Generally, if I need to work fast or feel like getting creative with composition, I'll use a camera handheld, though sometimes composition is so critical that I'll have to use a tripod. Each photographic situation will be different and may or may not call for the use of a tripod. Remember, when buying a tripod, don't skimp on the price. Buy the sturdiest one you can afford. The set for the first shot is fairly simple. I've got a white colour armour, which is a 12 foot roll of white paper, on the back wall, coming down into a nice scoop nice smooth scoop along the floor, then up over this platform, raised about nine inches. That's where Vicky's gonna lie down for the first shot. On top, I've just placed a couple of sheepskin rugs, add, add to the soft feel. Um, it's gonna be more interesting just having a plain white background. Today I'm shooting everything on transparency film. Kodak E100S 120 roll film. It's rated at 100 ASA, the same as the Fuji Instant film I'm using to proof the shots. So all the meter readings you'll hear relate to this film speed. The f-stop readings you'll hear me quote should give you an idea of the power relationships between the heads. For the first shot of Vicky is quite a soft shot and using soft lighting here. For the main light I've got two polyboards in a V uh, pointing towards Vicky at about just off 45 degrees onto her camera. Uh, there's one light going in, in there, one mono block. The setting, the reading where Vicky's going to be is just over 5.6. It's about 5.6 and a quarter. Also at the front, there's a polyboard there with another head going into it. This is a fill light. There, the, the f-stop is considerably down. A reading taken off there for Vicky is 2.8, f2.8. All that's doing is just filling in the shadows where you see the main lights coming from one side, creating shadows down here. We'll just put a little bit in just to, just to lift it so we don't get heavy dark shadows. The only other light I've got is a third light on the background that's got a grid set on, quite a narrow grid set, so we've got a focused beam of light concentrated at the bottom of the colour armour there. Uh, I've got a yellow gel on there to, to warm it up, give it some colour, and also a scrim, a piece of tissue paper, which helps just break, it, break up the honeycomb effect that you can sometimes get when the light passes through that grid. So overall, just over 5.6 on the front for the main light, I've got 2.8, f2.8 is the reading I get here. The cum cumulative effect of that is giving me a reading of 5, 6 and a half, and that's what I'm setting the camera at to shoot this. The background light is also set metered at about 5, 6 and a half on incidence. And uh, I'm going to set up 5, 6 and a half going, fairly close shot to Vicky, and see how it goes. Before any shoot, it's important to get to know your model a little. Before you even go near a camera, you should spend some quality time with your model. The main emphasis here is putting your model at ease. Talk about her involvement in this form of photography. Show her some of your work, and if she's brought along her own portfolio, then make sure you take the time to look at it. Then have a brief pre-shoot discussion about what you intend to do, showing her sketches or describing the various poses you intend shooting. But avoid unnecessary chit-chat, as your model will usually see through this facade and it quickly uses up valuable studio time. So once the set's in place and I've lit it, I take a couple of shots on instant film to check how the lighting looks. Bring your legs up at the back, cross them over, like that, yeah? A bit more, a bit more, that's it, good. It's also important to make sure the makeup looks good on film. That's lovely. Superb. Hold it there. You'll hear me referring to these instant pictures throughout the day as Polaroids. This is simply because the word Polaroid has become a standard term used for any instant film. Today I'm actually using Fuji instant film. Okay, bring it up to me. Come up to me. Bring your head straight. That's nice, good. Chin down a touch, and so that's nice, good. Okay. Relax a little. Having your model well prepared is of utmost importance. So if you're using a non-professional model, make sure you advise her to groom her body well. 
This should include shaving the legs, bikini line and under the arms. It's important that this is done at least 10 hours before the shoot. This will ensure that shaved areas don't appear red or blotchy in the final pictures. Fingernails and toenails should also be neatly manicured and polished. And finally, make sure your model doesn't wear any tight-fitting undergarments or jewellery on the day of the shoot, as these may leave marks or creases on her skin. And again, these will show up in the final pictures. Just bring yourself up a little as you are. There. No, no, that's lovely. That's where you are. Just, that's it. That's good. Okay, and just where you are, just bring, bring your eyes to me. That's lovely. On the camera, I'm using a shutter speed of 1 250th of a second to reduce the chance of interference from any ambient light. I'm trying out another light on here, just on the Polaroid, I've got a bit of the white coming on the background, I don't want that. What I'm asking Claire to do now is put a yellow gel on one of the heads and direct it in from the back of the set into here, hopefully picking up a bit of yellow there and a bit of yellow just catching around the light, a bit of yellow light catching around the edge of Vicky here. So I'm going to give that a go, put a Polaroid in and see what happens there. It's this area here I'm not happy with. It looks a bit dull and my eye is immediately drawn to it. That extra light should brighten this area and add some warmth. Also look out for the effect of the backlight on Vicky. There's a new light at the top left of your screen. Come up again. See what you're doing. Yeah. Oh, no. Okay. Can you switch your modelling light off? I'm just going to take the Polaroid. I want its power output to be slightly lower than the main light, just about half a stop down. Just whip your can manage that. Okay, so bring yourself up again, that's it, nice. You get in there and do the hair, Emma. Oh, yeah. And left to camera, that's good. Okay. Everything go? Right. See what that's looking like. There, that's a lighting problem solved. I've brightened that area and added a bit of backlight to Vicky. I just want to experiment a little now with a pose and camera angle. Bring your head up a little. That's nice, good. All right, look at that. Yeah, there's a bit of hair, straight hair come down the left. Oh, I think we'll have another Polaroid in a minute. Thank you. Got it. I know what you mean about looking a bit unnatural. Yeah, give that a go. Yeah. Are we going to see you? Yeah. Yeah, it's a little bulky on this left side. Hold it there. Bring the legs up again. A little bit more. In there. Good. That's it. Chin up a little. Just a little. Maybe down again. Sorry. That's good. Okay, relax. All right, let's go up. When we need to do the next one, I'll just ask for the leg. You okay there? Comfortable enough? This 
Push arm, come back. There, that's it. Pushing up. It's gorgeous. When it comes to choosing photographic equipment, remember this one important thing. Pieces of photographic equipment are nothing more than tools used to obtain one specific end result, and that's to capture a photographic image. You could own thousands of pounds worth of sophisticated equipment, but this won't make you a great photographer. If you only take mediocre pictures with a cheap camera, then I can assure you that the results will be much the same with an expensive one. The reason for this is that photographic equipment doesn't take pictures, people do. In the hands of a talented photographer, any equipment can lead to amazing results. If you're just entering the field of glamour photography, your best bet is to start off with a small amount of good, quality, reliable equipment. The simple to operate, and then, as you become more knowledgeable and proficient, you can add more equipment to your kit to meet your needs. When buying equipment, remember, you get what you pay for. So always buy the best you can afford, as cheap equipment is usually unreliable and can't withstand the rigours of constant daily use. When it comes to choosing which format to shoot on, bear these few things in mind. There are advantages and disadvantages with both 35mm and medium format. Most professionals use both depending on the situation. 35mm is convenient as it's small and lightweight, making the format fast and easy to work with, especially when handheld. Because of the small size, it's unobtrusive and presents less intimidation to a non-professional model. And finally, it's a lot more economical shooting on 35mm where film costs are concerned. On the other hand, the disadvantages are that because 35mm frame is small, viewing contact sheets can be difficult. Secondly, if you blow pictures up to really high magnifications, such as 20 by 24 inches, the overall sharpness, colour and image quality can start to suffer. Medium format equipment, on the other hand, has the advantage of a larger film size, which means viewing contact sheets and slides is much easier and the larger film size will withstand huge enlargements over 30 by 40 inches with hardly any loss in quality. Secondly, most medium format cameras have a leaf shutter lens, which means you can synchronise the flash at any shutter speed. This feature really comes into its own for outdoor work when you're trying to balance flash with ambient light. It also allows for a lot more lighting creativity in the studio. The disadvantages are that medium format equipment costs more and film stocks work out more expensive. Secondly, they're usually bigger and more bulky, making them more awkward to work with. But this is a small price to pay when you think of the extra quality in your final pictures. When it comes to reflectors, I nearly always use them, both outdoors and in the studio, to reduce contrast by filling in shadow areas. A well-placed reflector can raise the illumination significantly depending on the type and size of reflector you're using. You can also use reflectors to backlight part of your model or highlight part of a set or prop, as well as filling in shadows. Sometimes it's not always practical to use flash, so in these instances reflectors can be a great substitute. I'm using basically the same set here as I did for the first shot. The only difference being I've now put a sheet of black perspex on the platform. I'm going to create the whole mood of the shot through changing the lighting as well as Vicky's pose. The light's going to be harder and I'm using blue gels to create a colder atmosphere. You can see Claire gelling up a small softbox here for the fill light. Can you get a reading on this one? What's that? Is it? I wonder what we were getting before. Okay, super. Jump up there. Try again. Here, I'm just checking the light readings from all across the background. Do it again. A bit lower down. Here you can see I have a lens hood attached to the lens of the RZ. This is absolutely essential for studio work as lens flare can create some serious problems.
With all those flash heads firing off, sometimes it's difficult to prevent stray or spill light coming back towards the camera. I want it going over the top. Well, the modelling you have to come off this, right? Should be all right now, I think. It's so far away, I suppose. <laughs> if it burns, it burns. Here's a plan view of the set and lighting arrangement. It's not drawn to scale, but the diagram illustrates the positions of the lights, camera and model. Our main light is a medium-sized softbox, roughly 75 centimetres square. There's a white polyboard to the side of Vicky to reflect some light back from the main light into the shadow areas to bring out some detail. This is the source of our fill light. In front of Vicky on the studio floor, I've placed half a white polyboard to also throw a little light back. To give a bit of hair and backlight, the small softbox that you saw Claire setting up earlier is placed here, to the side of Vicky and behind. Down either side of the background, you can see polyboards with their black painted sides facing in towards the paper scoop. What they're doing is shielding the background from any stray light bouncing around the studio. Any spillage of light onto the background would mute the effect of the background lights, making the blue tones look washed out. Lighting for the background is provided by two heads, each fitted with a 7-inch Reflect Edition honeycomb grid. The grid restricts the spread of light from the flash head, reducing the coverage of its illumination. Sandwiched between the grid and the dish are a sheet of scrim and a blue gel, which gives the white background its rich blue tones. One head is aimed at the background scoop directly behind Vicky, and the other one is coming from the back of the set, hitting the floor area of the background. That's, that's perfect, yeah. Bring, can you bring your toes in a little bit at the back? Is this, are your knees slipping on that water? Um, slightly, but it's not a problem. No. Try them in a little bit more. There's that wall of polyboards in the background shading the paper scoop. The what? Oh yeah, we're machine clear. What are you doing sat down? <laughs> we don't know about the wind. No you can really you know, it can be quite a strong face there, yeah. Good. Is that wind ready to go, Claire? Okay. Is it catching? All right, so look at that. The bleeps you can hear in the background are coming from the flash heads. The bleep simply indicates that the head has charged and is ready to fire again. The makeup artist had to constantly attend to Vicky's makeup. Under the modelling lamps, it can sometimes get quite hot. This can cause eye makeup to smudge. Lip gloss can dry up and foundation can become shiny. There's an unattractive shadow down yes, your nose, otherwise. I turn it to the other side, but I turn it to, it's not a problem. There's a few things here I don't like. The first is I don't think the knickers suit Vicky, so I'm going to change them for a more flattering pair. Secondly, the water doesn't add anything to the shot. In fact, it looks messy, so I'm going to lose that. And lastly, you won't be able to see from the Polaroid, but under an eyeglass, I can see that Vicky's eyes need some darker makeup to lift them out. But apart from that, the lighting looks good and the exposure's right. Oh, God, just let me dry up. I've got the nib under me now when it's playing that wind machine. Pull it that way. Okay, and wind. Shake your head. Operating the wind machine is more difficult than it looks. To catch and lift the hair successfully, the angle of the machine right, yeah. has to be just right. Good. Okay, now relax. And Polaroid clear. Thank you. You have a rub. It's a bit early. Oh, 
That's nice. Very nice. Actually, we could spray you. Now that's all working well together. I'm happy to go ahead and shoot film. Uh, uh, Shot two. Shot three. Uh, three. So we'll call this B one, all right? B one, B two. Should we call it Shot B? Do the other ones A one, A two, all right? I always number and log my film religiously. It's important to keep a record of your exposures so you can gauge subsequent development, especially if you're shooting transparency film. It's not quite so critical on neg film though. If I'm shooting on tranny, I always take a couple of frames on what is known as a test roll before shooting the actual film. Here you can see today's test roll on the light box. I had the test roll developed first so I could adjust the development of the corresponding rolls accordingly. That's great. Get that hair, look, Claire, that's not even pointing at her. Right. That point of the, the hair. That hand just add a little. There, just a little. In a bit. There, good. Great, that looks great. Good stuff. Come on, Claire, get this wind going. That's it, nice and strong in the face, you're, you're in charge there, right? Good. Okay. Strong face. Good, chin down and touch, straight on, straight on to me, straight on the camera. Yeah? Good, that's great. Okay, relax. Emma's doing a good job here readjusting the clothes while I'm changing roles. Fingers out. Yeah. Like that. Straight, yeah. Good. Brilliant. That's okay, that's good. I like it. Can I see your thumb on that other hand? It's just looking like that. Yeah, yeah, good. Good, great. Okay. Nice, straight on. Try and lift the hair a bit more, Claire, if you can. That's nice. That's good, Vic. And that little bit there, yeah. Good. Okay, thanks for all. That's great. Okay, thank you.
For studio glamour work with flash lighting, I'd recommend using a film rated at between 1 and 200 ASA. Its relatively small grain will give you good quality images while still being fast enough to allow you to stop down to smaller apertures when you need to. Whether you choose to shoot transparency or neg film, it'll make little difference to the quality of your final results. Transparency, or slide film, will capture the finest detail and give rich saturated colours. However, camera exposures and subsequent film development are critical, so it's worth checking all your exposures using instant film before committing your shots to the real thing. You may prefer to shoot on neg film, which has a much wider exposure latitude and is capable of producing absolutely superb results. As for which brand, well, that's a personal choice. Each film has its own set of characteristics or feel, so it's best to test them out to see which you prefer. If you want consistent results, then buy professional film, which you know has been stored in a controlled environment. I just want to bring your attention to a couple of things regarding the law. The main purpose of this section of the programme is to simply make you more sensitive to certain areas that could cause an unsuspecting photographer some real problems. As I've already mentioned, if you're shooting a female model, having a female assistant is well worth considering. And there are three good reasons for this. The first is, a good assistant will make the shoot go smoother and you'll have an extra pair of hands to help. Secondly, the presence of another female will often make a female model feel more at ease and relaxed, which will inevitably lead to better pictures. And thirdly, the presence of an assistant will give you some vital legal protection. Moving on to the release form. As a general rule, you shouldn't exhibit or publish any photographs without first having obtained a signed release form from the model. It's a good idea to clarify this and make sure the model fully understands before you go ahead with the shoot. That way everyone knows where they stand. After all, you wouldn't want to spend the whole day shooting only to find out later that your model isn't so keen to sign the release form. Remember, if you don't get a signed release, your pictures will be unusable. Copies of representative model release forms can usually be obtained from professional photographic bodies. When it comes to makeup application, you'll probably find that most non-professional models have little or no talent for applying their own makeup for good photographic results. Most can apply their own makeup for everyday life, but there is a big difference between everyday makeup and makeup for photography. And even though a lot of professional models like Vicky, can competently apply their own, most professional photographers will still hire a makeup artist to do the job. Already you can see with um, Vicky's makeup as it is now, it's quite heavy. But if you were to actually look at the makeup when we first started the shoot earlier on today, you'll have noticed the makeup is quite subtle. Now, this is where people start to think that you don't need a makeup artist for photographic shoots. If we don't have a makeup artist for professional photo shoots, the skin can look very flat, can look very dull, can look very pasty. And although Vicky's got a lovely tan here, she would still look quite pale. So uh, the whole point of photographic makeup is to put structure back into the face, to um, enhance the features, um, um, and even for a subtle look, you're basically wanting to, to make the face look as open and enhanced as, as possible. We need to put structure back into the face or otherwise it looks too flat, into the eyes, uh, cheekbones around the, the forehead. So, um, having a makeup artist for a photo shoot um, is important whether the makeup is heavy or subtle. I think the art of, of photographic makeup is to, as you can see, sometimes it's, it's quite heavy makeup, but the art of it is to put a lot of makeup on but make it look like there's not much makeup on. Um, sometimes a lot of corrective work is needed with blemishes, under eye bags and spots and pimples and things like that. So we may need a lot of makeup to, to cover that up. So that's our job to, to stop it looking like there's a lot of makeup there. Secure at the top. Awesome. Yeah. Now it's bringing in the, the, the hips. 
Here Claire's hanging lengths of material from the last light background support stands to create our backdrop. Five six three. Five six three. Okay. That would be about right. One more time. Third. Five six a quarter. Five six and a half. Five six and a half. Okay. The third shot we do with Vicky. He's got a very simple lighting setup. At the front, I've got a super soft six hundred. Uh, that's set at five six and a half on Vicky. We've got four poly boards around just to try and soften even further the effect. We're going to get a bit of modelling on Vicky's face here. It's set slightly off camera angle. The second light, the only other light we have, is a small softbox, a 75 centimetre softbox at the back. That's going directly onto the back of Vicky's head to give a nice hair light, a rim light around her. It's also picking up a sheen off this purple material, this crushed velvet we have. And that's all we're using for this last uh, third one. I could see some of your, this, your, leg, your foot coming out the side of it, just so it doesn't... What's it yeah, like? yeah. Oh. That's right. Bring yourself, bring yourself up. You're going to do the hair in a bit, yeah? Yeah. <coughs> so you've got to be, you know, quite right. sexy, seductive on this one, I think, yeah. Good. Oh yeah, well, just see what life's like. Okay, you get and do your bit in. Everything seems okay with the set and the lights here. I'm just going to alter the camera angle to make the shot more flattering and also change the lighting mood on the background. Just ruching up the velvet on the floor. It's got the uh, a duvet under there on top of a poly board. This isn't quite so hard on Vicky's knees, but it's still fairly firm to stop her sinking. The duvet just gives the crushed velvet a bit more texture. Okay. If that's okay, we'll go straight in, alright? There you go, that's better. More flattering for Vicky and the background mood is now just right. Gorgeous. Hold it for a couple, will you, Vic? Another one. Oh, yeah. That's lovely. That's like, it's just that bend in the arm, and you've got a bit of bend in the arm, I think, yeah? That one. Go and do it again. You do it. You're doing it well. Good. Okay, let's have a look at that and I think we shoot. Okay, that's good. And me? Okay, here we go. Fake 250, okay? Yes, okay. Mm. You wind these on? No, you didn't. That's fine, thank you. It is, yeah, just before you give me. Chin down a touch. Chin down a touch? Yeah, that's lovely, gorgeous, got it. Your arms back, this one back a little, that's it, opens you up. Not too much, too much shelf halfway. This, you need pulling up under the arm. Emma, yes. you, could you, um, it's just Sorry. cutting into Vicky. Sorry, I keep asking you, but you're so good at adjusting the clothes. It's just cutting in under Vicky's okay. arm there a little bit. You've done it tighter now. <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is that 
Yeah, yeah, that's great. That's fine. Good. As a photographer, you'll need a very keen eye to spot anything that doesn't appear right or looks out of place on the set. You should constantly be looking out for tiny faults or flaws on the model and background. Remember, if you spot them later on when you get your pictures back from the lab, it'll be too late. Good, that's lovely. There's a one little hair poking out the side, bothering me. That's it. That's it, that's lovely, that's got it, gorgeous. Just that way a little. That's it, good. It's important that your lighting setups are well thought out and that your model and set are lit by design and not by chance. Lighting a model and set can be an art in itself and sometimes the whole process of lighting setups can sound rather formidable. However, it's not as difficult as it might sound, especially if you think of the lights falling into these primary categories. The main light, the fill light and the subsidiary lights. It will also help if you think of building your lighting setups around the model and set one at a time. One of the most straightforward lighting arrangements you can use is a standard three-point light setup. This consists of the main light, which will set the standard for the other lights to follow. Once the main light is positioned and metered, the other lights, which include the fill, backlight and background lights, should be adjusted in relationship to the main light. If you were to leave the main light on its own, it would create shadows on both the model and the set. In addition to this, the model and the set will appear to have a lot of contrast. Whatever the main light hits will be very bright, and the areas that it doesn't hit will be very dark. So this is where the fill light comes in. The aim of the fill light is to lighten those dark areas and reduce the overall contrast. Remember, the darker the shadows, the more sombre the mood, and the lighter the shadows, the more airy the mood. When shooting on colour film, the fill light is usually set somewhere between one and two full f-stops below the main light. This effect creates mood and gives the picture a three-dimensional appearance. Although the guidelines for fill lights are very loose, there are some rules that you should always follow. The first being that your fill light should never have its power output equal to or stronger than that of the main light. Secondly, the fill light should never create any shadows of its own. To ensure this doesn't happen, use only a soft fill light that's bigger than the main light and make sure that the fill light is set to a lower power output than the main light. In addition to the main and fill lights, there are many other lights that can be used in studio glamour photography. These lights can be used for lighting parts of the model, the background or the set and are usually called backlights, hair lights, background lights or accent lights. Accent lights are used to light one or more portion of the model, set or prop and are usually more directional. The backlight is placed behind the model and is intended to separate the model from the background or to outline the model's body or highlight the hair or a combination of all three. Finally, the background lights are designed to illuminate the background and separate the model from it. Remember that the pose, mood and setting should determine the lighting and not vice versa. Don't make the mistake of setting up the lights first then constructing the set. This is the wrong approach and will lead to some mixed and unpredictable results. I'm just using a simple black paper scoop for the last shot, though in the finished picture the background will appear deep red because of the way I'm going to light it. You can see in the background behind Claire that the backlight is mounted on a boom stand. You might have noticed that both lights in the previous shot were also mounted on boom arms. Sometimes this is the only way to get your lights into the desired position. Though a word of caution, be careful that you weight them correctly so they don't topple over. Thank you. Oh dear, is that on full power?
Five, six and a quarter. Let's have a stop then. That would be right. Five, six and a quarter. So this is probably going to be about five, six and three quarters. Is it? Yes. Okay, don't. Fine. I'll often power up my assistant while I'm working on the lighting set to see how it's building up before getting the model in. The model's usually still getting her makeup done. Thank you. You all right? The final shot with Vicky, we've got Vicky on this Harley and it's a bit more complicated. We're using five lights here. The main light's coming from this called a strip light. It's a 140 strip light, narrow, narrow beam of light coming on as the main light. Uh, as a fill, over there, I've got a small softbox, about 75 centimetres square. It's got a blue gel in it to fill in all the shadows created by this light on the uh, Vicky's face. It'll give us a fill in blue. In addition to that, we've got the one, one light up there, red gelled again with a grid, going onto the back, onto the black colour armour background. That gives us a nice red glow in the background when it fires off. I know it looks black now. Uh, there's another... Another head over there, also red gelled without a grid, it's just got a, a dish on it. That's come into light down there, we'll put red on the floor, also highlight a bit of red around the edge of the bike and in Vicky's hair, complementing this blue here. And finally, you might just see there, we've got one head going into a white poly board. Um, could you switch it on for me, Claire, just to show what it's doing? That's also gelled up, that's picking out the chrome. The big white light that's th been thrown back should pick out the chrome here, just highlighting the bike. So we've got five lights here and uh, the most tricky situation we've had today. So, just to recap, here's another plan of our set. The main light is the long narrow 140 softbox, the 140 referring to its length in centimetres. The blue fill light is coming from this blue gelled softbox. Our main backlight is almost overhead Vicky on a boom arm. This head lighting the floor and backlighting our subject is fitted with a reflector dish which illuminates a broad area. This light providing some highlight reflection on the bike is also fitted with a dish and bounced into some polyboards. Can you just get your legs so it's not coming straight onto me, it's coming bang onto me. Will it go the other way? A little yeah. bit more? That's better, that's better, that's it. Great, good stuff. All right, Have a look at that. Everything's fine with the exposure and lighting first time, but I'm having a few problems with the way the jacket looks. Here I'm adjusting the way the leather jacket looks on Vicky. The jacket we were sent was two sizes too big, so I had to gather up all that loose material and clip it together using bulldog clips. This was the only way to prevent Vicky being swamped by the jacket. This is a common practice for photographers, especially in fashion photography. Thanks. You're welcome. Finally, I've got the jacket looking right and not covering too much of Vicky. So I'll put a film back on the camera and start working on the shot. Good, that's good. That's great. Mm. Look at that. <coughs> Take your position, because I just don't want the jacket to look too bulky over here. If you're using a motorbike or other large heavy item during a shoot, then safety is of utmost importance. For this shot, I made sure the bike's kickstand was fully extended and the bike was safe and stable for Vicky to sit on. Okay, so it's a mean street, so okay, Vicky? Yeah. One more. Yeah.
Okay, just vary the pose a little bit. I like, I like what you're doing. Just I don't know. Have you got much movement on there? Are you really just clinging on? Okay. Yeah. I'll just come out and go back in just to give a bit of variety. Yeah. These are glasses. Um, I tell you, yeah, she did. You were more further forward, weren't you? Yeah. You okay? I'm not in the reflection of it now. I don't mind the reflection, I just think it's a bit nice. In fact, <laughs> that's more of a pose where they'd be dangling. That's great, Vicky, super. Gorge. Can you pull the jacket down? But can you pull? Yeah, it just needs coming down. It's riding up a little. Just to. That's it. Okay. Yeah. Get another roll ready. Yeah, that's nice straight on. Dang that, dang, let them drop. I just want to see the, the frames come round a bit. Maybe you can open them up to me. Don't twist them the other way. Is that easy? Yeah. That's it. Twist a bit more. Just, just, that's it. You got them there. A bit more. Sorry, though. Back again. There, very good. That's just lovely. Go back. That's it, good, right. Many photographers forget that all shoots are made up of three parts, those being the planning of the shoot, the shoot itself, and thirdly, those all-important moments immediately after the shoot. Some photographers just forget about the model once the shoot is over. This is not only unprofessional, it's also impolite. So make sure you spend an appropriate amount of time with your model after the shoot, especially with non-professionals. Praise the work she's just done and tell her how great the pictures are going to be, but don't be patronising and don't lie. If you spend 10 minutes or so at the end of every shoot following this rule, it will result in your model going away happy, and that's the way you want to end all your photo sessions. The model will then praise you as a photographer to other models, and she'll be more than happy to work for you again in the future. Remember, it's not only polite, it's also professional and good business. Well, we've come to the end of the programme, so I hope you've picked up some useful hints and tips. Now all that remains is for you to go away and put into practice some of the things you've seen and build on them, developing your own unique style. Remember, you can always watch this programme again a week or so before your next shoot to refresh your memory. So until then, good luck.